Uh, okay, there we go. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a slight, what is actually a slight change in the the, the lecture series. We've got uh, Mark Wilkinson, Dr. Mark Wilkinson from the University of Edinburgh stepping in for us at last minute. So big thank you to Mark. Before Mark starts, the only real piece of news that uh, I have to give out is to encourage everybody to come to our uh, fellows night in two weeks time but even more so to encourage anyone who's just got anything they might want to present to come forward and just give a little presentation if it's maybe even it's five or ten minutes on anything that you have been doing or done that's geological related and you'd like to share with the rest of the society so we really do need some more more presenters even if it's about your geology that you had, you know, your local geology under, in your local council under lockdown conditions or something like that. Anything indeed. But um, I'd like to uh, welcome Mark Wilkinson tonight. Um, Mark is a, a colleague of mine in the University of Edinburgh School of Geosciences, where he's a senior lecturer in geology, uh, specialising very much in carbon capture and storage, among other things. Um, Mark started off his PhD was actually on concretions. And uh, I've been in the field many times with Mark. And, what more uh, interesting is something that could you no, not, not, not much. I mean, especially when you start seeing him in the field waxing lyrical about concretions, and he runs off to look at concretions. Um, but um, so, yeah, Mark uh, works on carbon capture and storage, among other things. He's also initiator of the geoenergy master's degree at the, the University of Edinburgh. And tonight he'll be talking about uh, not carbon capture and storage or oil field reservoirs or such or diagenesis, but why are the highlands so high? And this is one of the things I find very impressive about Mark is that he has his, uh, his sort of professional work on geoenergy and CCS and all that, but he also has an extensive knowledge of everything else, um, particularly sort of uh, sedimentological, I was going to say paleontological, but he confesses that he knows nothing about that. But one of his areas of interest is, is looking at uh, why the highlands are so high, part of the ge geological history of Scotland. And I'm really looking forward to what Mark's going to say, because there's been times in the field where we've been around the coast and he's picked up bits of chalk and everywhere we go, we seem to find these bits of chalk and he's you know, told me how this will, you know, could relate to parts of the Cenozoic uplift. And this evening, we're going to get the condensed version of why that is. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark to present this evening's lecture. Over to you, Mark. Thanks very much. Um, I've just had a warning saying my internet connection is unstable, so um, hopefully, cross fingers, this is all going to work. Okay, so first thing is let's get the slides up. Right, uh, anyone fancy confirming that they can actually see a picture of the Isle of Skye? Yeah, okay, that's fantastic, thanks. So, I'm not going to introduce the, uh, the Scottish Highlands to the present day audience. I'm quite sure that uh, you'll have been there, um, possibly doing geology, uh, quite probably on holiday or going hill walking or you know, whatever. Um, what I'm going to talk about is not the actual age of the rocks in the Highlands. I think we've all got a pretty good idea of what age the rocks are that, that form the basic Highland geology. Um, but the actual age of the hills themselves, the actual age of the topography, you know, and uh, as it says in the title, you know, why are the highlands actually high? Because if you think about it, there are quite a few bits of um, the Caledonian orogeny um, around that are actually underwater. So uh, the photograph I've opened up with, that's actually the Isle of Skye. Uh, that's the Coolin Hills. Um, it's more a pretty than anything else, but it will become apparent at the very end that there is a link um, between the Coolin Hills and, and what I'm going to talk about. So, the highlands themselves, the actual topography. Um, I mean, how long have the highlands actually been highlands? Now, it turns out this is surprisingly controversial, and there are two basic ideas. 
Now, the first of these ideas is expressed in a, uh, in, in a diagram such as the one on the screen now, which is a paleogeography of Scotland published in 1995, so it's relatively recent, although it's pretty much inspired by the work of Arkell from the 1930s. And uh, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, by the way. Um, if we look at the outline of uh, the land, which is the horizontal stripy bits on the, on the, uh, on the diagram. Now, this is the Colovian, so we're, we're middle Jurassic here. So in the middle Jurassic, according to this, the, much of the shape of the highlands was as it is at present. Basically, you can see the shape of Scotland, uh, most of it, on, on that map. Um, it breaks down a bit as you go off to the east, as you go into the North Sea. Of course, the North Sea hadn't got, got going in the middle Jurassic. Uh, there wasn't really anything called it. There wasn't really any North Sea to any, to any extent. And if you look through all the paleogeography maps that people have published through from basically the end of the Caledonian orogeny, which is sort of, let's call it Devonian, all the way through to present day, then what you see is that the Caledonian mountains are, or the Scottish highlands are, are land. So the implication is quite clear. The topography we see today, according to these maps, is a relic of the topography from the Caledonian orogeny. So just to remind ourselves, I mean, the Caledonian orogeny was a huge orogenic event, a big mountain building event. It's, it built a mountain chain, you know, through uh, present day Norway, Scotland, Ireland, into the Appalachian mountains. Uh, we don't know how high it was, as far as I'm aware. Um, it could have been Alpine in stature, might have been Himalayan, perhaps, who knows. Um, but, and the idea basically is that that huge mountain chain through time has been progressively eroded until we get to the present day, and we've got about a kilometre of relief left, roughly the height of the highest hills in Scotland. So that's idea number one. And uh, it's current, if you call 1995 current, I guess it's a few years ago now, and it's been around for quite a while. But it's not the only idea around. In fact, there's an idea which is much more radical and has been around since at least the end of the 19th century. Now, many people have heard of Judd. If you've been to Arran, I'm sure many of you have been to Arran and walked along the west coast and inspected Judd's dikes, that's Judd. Uh, he was um, quite active in his day, uh, a good field geologist, I think. Uh, the diagram on the right is an entirely gratuitous map of Judd's dikes. Um, has nothing at all to do with talk, just to remind us who Judd is. Judd um, came up with an idea for the evolution of the highlands, which is pretty radical now, and really for when he proposed it was um, really quite amazing. So what did Judd say? Judd had a look at the geology of Scotland, and he said, we've got Mesozoic sedimentary basins on the west coast of Scotland. So that's like the, the, in the Hebrides, for example. And we've got Mesozoic sedimentary basins on the east of Scotland, as exposed at uh, the Helmsdale kind of Helmsdale Brewer area, and they're quite similar in many in many ways. A similar age, and they've got kind of similar style of development. So, just said, since the, he said these two sets of basins, the ones on the east coast and the ones on the west coast, actually they were originally joined by other sedimentary basins, which were developed on top of what are now the Scottish Highlands. And since the Mesozoic, these basins have been eroded away, leaving us with the metamorphic basement that these basins were developed on. Now, that's a pretty radical idea that we've had Mesozoic sedimentary basins sitting on a, what are currently the Scottish Highlands, which have been uplifted since the Mesozoic and simply eroded off, obliterated, gone. Now, he, uh, he wrote his ideas in English, which uh, you couldn't write in a modern scientific paper. Nowadays, it's all caveats and, um, and things, but uh, he, he actually wrote it was impossible to avoid the conviction, to, to avoid the conviction. I, I don't think anyone would claim it was truly impossible, but um, in, impossible to avoid the conviction um, that, uh, that, that basically these East Coast and West Coast Mesozoic segments were originally uh, connected by a series of, series of basins covering, as it says here, the greater part of the vast area of Scotland. And that is simply irreconcilable with all those paleogeography maps. 
you can't have both. Either Scotland has been a landmass since the Caledonian, since the Devonian, or it's had a series of Mesozoic sedimentary basins sitting on top of it, which have subsequently been eroded. So, which is it? Let's have a look first at um, one of these, or at least a little tiny part of one of these sedimentary basins. So that's Tom um, of the introduction to this, uh, of the uh, introduction uh, to this talk. Standing on the Isle of Skye, um, now I don't know if anybody's been here, uh, but the sort of lumpy thing that Tom's right foot is standing on is a, um, a raised sauropod uh, footprint from a sauropod dinosaur. And some of the water filled holes in the foreground, those are also footprints kind of weathered there. So on the west coast, what we have is we have a series of sediments deposited in a variety of shallow water environments, but all quite close to sea level. But these are all part of a sedimentary basin. These are a sedimentary fill, uh, Mesozoic sediments, filling a sedimentary basin that was active in the Mesozoic. And some of you may have been to the other side of the country and, and actually looked at the, the rocks in the Helmsdale Brora area, uh, which are actually quite famous for their fault controlled sedimentation. Now, what Judd didn't know and couldn't possibly have known is that when you go further east than the Scottish Highlands into the what is now the North Sea, that those sedimentary basins carry on. They go under the Inamore Firth and into as far as Norway. And I'm pretty sure if Judd, Jed, Judd had known that those sedimentary basins had been there, those Mesozoic basins going really all the way across the North Sea, uh, he'd have been even more convinced um, of his idea that the, they, they once covered what we now call the Scotch Highlands. We have some evidence that we can use to, to sort of look at this. Because um, one of the things we're obviously interested in is, is if, if there were sedimentary basins on the highlands, what we now call the highlands, and they've been eroded off, you know, what can we do to prove that those that, that erosion has taken place? There's a technique called appetite fission track analysis, or AFTER to its friends. And it's a peculiar technique. I don't have time to go into great detail on it. Uh, I'm not an expert on it anyway. Um, the photograph, which is uh, lower, lower left on the screen, that's a single appetite grain. Um, there's 20, 20 micron scale bar at the bottom there. So that's a transmission light photograph of a single appetite grain. And I'm sure you can see all those little dashes. Now what those are is appetite contains uranium. And as the uranium decays, it gives off radiation. And the radiation goes blasting out from the uranium atoms and leaves a little trail of damage. So each one of those little lines is actually a radiation damage line as the radiation is zoomed through the appetite. Now what people do is they measure the lengths of these lines and they, they make little histograms and then they do some fancy maths and they claim that they can work out a lot about the uplift history of an area. Uh, the reason that it works is basically is if you, if you heat the appetite up those lines uh, shorten and eventually vanish. So the, the more you heat it the shorter they get and eventually they just disappear. So it, you can tell you a lot about the heating and, and cooling history of, of, of rocks. All you need is some rocks with some appetite grains in. Appetite's surprisingly common in sandstones, in sedimentary rocks. Um, not very big, but it, it is there. So if you travel around and you collect uh, bits of rock and you separate all these appetite grains out and do all this work on them, you can try to estimate how much uplift has been post Mesozoic across Scotland. So if we take a look at the left-hand um, diagram uh, above the photograph, uh, we can see Scotland sticking out there. And uh, we've got a we've got a scale, a gray scale, which shows us estimated erosion since the Cretaceous. It's a, it's a sort of that light gray, uh, light gray color. And if we look on the scale below, that's from about 500 meters of erosion to about a kilometer. Now that's the minimum estimate. So the minimum estimate for erosion is about 500 meters to a kilometer. The diagram on the right, which is uh, obviously shows the whole of the UK, but we're only interested in the Highlands, shows uh, the maximum estimate. 
and uh, that's that sort of darker gray. So that's between about a kilometer and a half and two kilometers. So this technique says you've lost somewhere between about half a kilometer and two and two kilometers of sediment off the top of, of rock. You've lost that much rock off the top of the highlands since the end of the Cretaceous. Now I should just say that um, although the people who use this technique think it's the bee's knees, not everybody likes it. Some people think it's more like witchcraft, to be quite honest, than geology. And one of the reasons people don't like it is that the technique often identifies uplift events for which we have no independent evidence. So people are like, well, I can't see it any other way. Are you sure that really, are we really have an, an uplift event there? And the other thing that's really peculiar about this technique is it doesn't seem to pick up the post-glacial uplift, which is the, one of the very few, few uplift events we're really pretty comfortable, uh, which is also a bit weird. Anyway, um, like I said, the people who work on this really like it. Uh, and it does tend to suggest there has been significant post-Cretaceous erosion of the Highlands area. Another piece of evidence that suggests that there's been significant erosion. The photograph shows a uh, Devonian conglomerate um, which was actually would have been eroded off the Caledonian mountain. So when, when Scotland was part of this huge Caledonian mountain chain, it was eroding like crazy, um, as mountain belts do, and shedding uh, generally rather poorly sorted conglomerates and sandstones. This is a conglomerate exposure. This particular one is near Loch Fleet, uh, north of Inverness. And what's obvious about this is it's, it's no longer a pile of loose sand and boulders, it's rock. It's, uh, it's pretty solid rock. Um, you need a hammer to break it. And as you can see, it makes quite a sizable cliff. Now, in order to turn loose sediment into rock, you've got to bury it. Now, you can discuss how much you need to bury it by, but I'd say you're going to be pushed to turn loose rock into sediment like this with less than about two kilometers of burial. Could be more, but it's unlikely to be very much less. So even the most shallow or even the youngest are solidly uh, lithified. So we must have had at least a couple of kilometers of sediment on top of them, and that's been eroded off, which fits actually quite well with the, the appetite data we saw. We can try a, another technique to see if we can quantify what we've had on top of the highlands, which is now missing. And so what I've done is I've said, okay, if we erode the highlands, then that sediment that comes off that eroded rock, it's got to go somewhere. If we can find it and measure it, then we can sort of imagine piling it back onto the highlands and seeing basically how much there is and what it's made of. Fortunately for me, I didn't need to do this. I didn't, know, didn't need to go charging around the North Sea trying to find sediment. Uh, other people have done this in great detail. Thank you to all the people who go around um, doing seismic stratigraphy in the North Sea. People have tried to quantify the amount of sediment and its age uh, in the sedimentary basin surrounding the, surrounding the highlands. All I needed to do was find the numbers in the literature, which is obviously good. So the diagram shows a map of the northern uh, part of the highlands. Now, this is, a, this is an example from the Paleocene. Um, and the, the known sediment that we have uh, in the Paleocene is found in the Faroe Shetland Basin to the northwest and the North Sea. Uh, which it, here is just labelled Paleocene sediment, which is to the, the southeast of the, the highland. Notice in this case, I'm including the um, Orkney Shetland Ridge as part of the highlands. I mean, geologically, they're the highlands. Uh, they're, they just happen to be a bit underwater at the moment. So the idea is we've eroded the highlands and we've shed sediment of this age into these two sedimentary basins. How much is there? Well, we have estimates of that. 
Um, so, for example, for the Faroe Shetland Basin, um, the, there's a, an estimate of the volume of Paleocene sediment. 35,000 to 55,000 cubic kilometers of sediment. Not a small amount, I'm sure you agree. Notice there's quite an uncertainty in that number. And not all of the sediment in that basin has come off the highlands because at the time there was land to the northwest of the Faroe Shetland Basin, now represented by the Faroe Isles. And we can also, so some of the sediment in the Faroe Shetland Basin has come from Scotland. Some of it has come from the other side, the other side of the basin. Now that's been estimated as well. 60 to 80% of the total sediment came from uh, the highlands. But nonetheless, again, that puts some, you know, it's, it's an uncertainty. We don't know the extent. And we also need to, if we want to do this little kind of calculation, we need to estimate the area that the highlands, the, the highlands had at that time. Now, the maximum area is defined by the limits of the Paleocene sediment to the south east and the Faroe Shetland Basin to the, north, to the northwest. Can't have been further out than that because we know that's where the sediments are accumulated. That gives us the maximum area. Now the minimum, that's labeled max EA, e, e stands for erosive, so it's maximum erosive area, or eroded, I suppose. How about the minimum area? And that's more tricky, because we don't know for sure where uh, exactly how much of the highlands was actually sticking out the ground at the time. So for a minimum area, I've basically drawn a sort of envelope around the Scottish, present day Scottish coastline, around the Shetland and Orkney Isles. And that gives you what's labeled there as min EA, minimum eroded area. And again, that puts some considerable uncertainty into the calculation. So how do you deal with what's well, a very, very simple calculation? You know, I've got a certain volume of sediment. If I put that volume onto an area, how thick is it? Couldn't be much easier than that. How can you deal with this, even a simple calculation, where all the input values are massively uncertain? Well, fortunately, lots of people have had these problems before. I haven't invented anything new here. Um, the oil industry, for example, when it's um, estimating the volume of oil in a field, it has the same problem. So we use the technique known as the Monte Carlo approach. Uh, for those who are into that kind of thing, it's coded in R, so it's a little bit of computer programming. I'm going to explain quickly what the Monte Carlo approach is for the benefit of those of you who haven't come across it. So here's our equations, very simple. The thickness of sediment, uh, which spread evenly over the highlands, is equal to the volume times the percentage from the highlands divided by the area. It's very simple. And what, the, what we do is with a computer, we choose a volume, a try again, we choose a value of the volume within the range that we know the volume is in. So if it was uh, 30, 35 to 55,000 cubic kilometers, we choose a number in that range. The computer chooses a random number inside that range. Chooses a random number from, for a percentage, and it chooses a random number for the eroded area within the range that we want them to be. Now we can also set what kind of distribution we have within that range. It could be a equal chance of choosing any number, it could be a normal distribution, uh, it could be any other distribution. So there is some, uh, some decision making to make in, in doing this. It's not entirely straightforward. Now the computer then takes these, in this case, three random, these three randomly chosen numbers, multiplies them together and gets an answer for the sediment thickness. That's one answer. So we ask the computer to do that um, thousands and thousands of times. Uh, I think when I published this, I got it to do it a million times, which with a modern computer just takes a few seconds. So instead of getting one answer, what we get is a distribution. And uh, you, can, you can plot that up as a histogram, like the picture in the, the little histogram uh, at the bottom, um, bottom right. But there are other ways of showing it. So I'm just going to show you how I, how I prefer to look at the actual answer. That's how I prefer to look at the answer. Now, this is, uh, this is a graph that shows the answers, uh, the sort of, you know, how thick our segments expressed showing this uncertainty in the answer. Now, it's a very easy thing to read. Along the horizontal axis, we've got our answer. How, how thick was our rock? 
going from about a kilometer up to a bit more than three kilometers. And the way that we read them is let's, let's take the red curve, the red dotted curve. So this is the thickness of sediment of Paleocene plus Eocene age, okay? It's at least a kilometer thick. So our lowest number, when we plot these up as a distribution like this, the lowest value we get is about a kilometer. The highest value is read off the top here. <laughs> Zoom is unfortunately, for me, is covering over the very top there. Um, and that's just over two kilometers. So our answer is between about a kilometer and a bit above two kilometers. And if you want to know the most likely one, it's actually just simply read, um, read off the 0.5 points. We take 0.5 on the vertical axis and we read across, we find the graph, we go down, it gives us something like uh, 1,300 or 1,400 meters. So the advantage of doing it like this is not only do we get a best estimate, but we also get a, a range, a really good idea of what the range is. So the answer between about one and two and a bit kilometers with a best answer of something like uh, a bit less than 1.5 kilometers long. Two things you need to know. This is rock as in mineral. So um, sandstones, for example, are not just rock, are not just mineral, they're also porosity, they're also space. So a typical sandstone might have, let's call it 15, 20% porosity. So since this thickness is expressed as mineral, the real rocks would be thicker because they've got space inside them. So if we take the central value of about um, 1.3 or 1.4 kilometers, then by the time we've added a bit of porosity in there, it's going to be a bit over 1.5 kilometers. And this is an average. That assumes that we spread the sediment absolutely evenly over the whole of the highlands. But it, it probably wasn't totally even. I mean, why would it be? So some bits might have been zero meters thickness. So to get an average of one and a half kilometers, you're going to need some bits, which are probably up to three kilometers. So it's quite a lot of rock. And the other thing is it doesn't include the chalk. I'll show some photographs of chalk later. I'm, I'm sure people are familiar with it. The thing about the chalk is it's a limestone. So when you weather it away, uh, you end up with not much at all, really, mostly just dissolved. It does leave a few flints, if you're lucky. I'll talk about those at the end. Uh, but basically, chalk weathers away to nothing. So not only have you had this thickness we've got here, but in, in addition to these calculated thicknesses, we've got whatever chalk was sitting on the, island, on the highlands, if it ever was there. I'll talk about whether it ever was there in a few minutes. Now, I've not answered the question. Anybody who's been listening and following, uh, the question I set myself was, did we have sedimentary basins on top of the highlands? And so far, all I've done is prove that there was quite a lot of erosion. Um, that's okay. There could have been some sedimentary basins there, but there may not have been. So how am I going to work out whether some of that eroded rock was actually sediment, sed sediment sitting in sedimentary basins, or was it just all the metamorphic rocks that we see at present day? To solve that, we're going to need, uh, I'm going to need to convince you of, um, of, of a point using this diagram. So this is a diagram showing the stratigraphy of the North Sea. A uh, little bit complicated. Actually, we only need a, a small part of it. Um, so first thing is the time scale. So if you look on the left hand side, the present day is at the top and we go down through the Cenozoic and at the bottom uh, where it goes white at the bottom, that's basically the top of the Cretaceous. So time wise, we're looking all the way from uh, latest Cretaceous up to present day. The only column we need to really look at is the one that's labeled formation under Northern North Sea. Now, if we look down there, we can see near the bottom, we've got some yellow labeled rocks or yellow colored rocks. Those are sandstones. And they're present at the bottom of the column, but there's none at the top. Those are very well sorted marine sandstones, which build out from the Scottish mainland into the present day North Sea. There are good oil and gas reservoirs, particularly oil. Uh, see large oil fields in those, in those sandstones. They're only present in the, in basically in the Paleocene, Neocene, and going just up into the Ligocene there. 
Now, if you look in the literature, the explanation for why these sands are present in the Paleogene and not in the younger sediment is because the explanation is the highlands were uplifted really quickly and they were eroded really quickly. And that gives you sandstone. And then as the erosion rate slowed, then you ended up with a lot of mud. The, the whites, the, the, the non-yellow stuff is basically mudstone and siltstone and just generally sort of less well sorted sed sediment. And that, I don't believe that. I mean, if I take a particular rock, let's say a, it could be a, a samite, a metamorphosed sandstone, or it could be a pre-existing sandstone. I don't think that what I get when I weather it is going to depend much on the, on the, on the speed, or the rate at which I weather it. I mean, if I start off with quartz-rich sandstone, I can't turn that into a shale, no matter how fast or slowly I weather it. So if I want a sand-rich sediment, I'm going to have to erode some sand-rich rocks. And if I want lots of shaly um, rocks, uh, more, I'm going to have to erode something with a lot more clay mineral. So here's my claim. Those yellow sands are the result of eroding Mesozoic sedimentary basins off the highlands. Why are they so sand rich? Because they're second cycle sediments. So we're eroding something into sedimentary basins. All that, all those processes that take place in during the deposition of sediments, uh, transporting rivers, um, movement, movement of the sediment on shallow seas by waves and tides and currents, they all sort the sand out. They tend to leave the sand kind of local to the area and they flush away all the, all the mud, leaving it with very, very sand-rich sediments. When you erode those sand-rich sediments, you get more sand-rich sediment. Now, once you've run out of sedimentary basin, you've eroded them all off and erode it, you're eroding rocks that are quite similar to the present day metamorphics. Then um, we've got much less sorting and we don't get these really, really well sorted very, very extensive sandstones, which are shown in yellow there. So a bit of a leap of faith that, you know, I guess you either believe it or you don't. The, anybody who knows anything about, or anything who knows a lot perhaps about um, tracing sediment provenance, uh, that is to say, where did sediment come from? Uh, may be wondering, can we use heavy minerals to, um, to sort this out? And the answer is no, um, we don't have much data and uh, they're notoriously reworked anyway. So if anybody was just thinking that it doesn't work, I had a good look at that. Okay, that's a bit weird. Now. So, so now you know why when I showed this diagram earlier, I split Paleocene and Eocene away from the rest of it. Because I'm going to claim that the Paleocene and Eocene sediment that we see is at least largely the eroded metamorph, uh, the, the eroded Mesozoic sedimentary basin. Uh, and then the, the post um, Eocene is, is largely the metamorphic basement that we see at present day. That's my claim. So if you want to cover the highlands in a couple of kilometers of sediment, it's got to come from somewhere. The highlands are not that small. And if you, uh, if you want to cover them in a couple of kilometers of sediment, it, you've got to erode something, and you've got to erode something pretty big. So I've had a good look at likely sources. I mean, you know, where can you erode to get that much sediment? And the answer is, well, nowhere, actually. Um, just to demonstrate I've had a good think about this, the map shows a huge uplift and erosion event in the Middle Jurassic. Um, so the, in, the, in the Middle Jurassic, um, something that may have eventually become the Icelandic plume. Uh, I don't know if people believe in plumes, but if you do, um, the thing that's currently under Iceland was probably under the North Sea in the middle of Jurassic, and it, it uplifted the North Sea and caused widespread erosion, shedding sediment, you know, uplift an area, shed sediment. And we know roughly how much sediment came off it. Uh, you can do a back of the envelope calculation. So there's a number down there. 70 to 80,000 cubic kilometers. Well, that's a fair bit of sediment. But there's no guarantee that it all ended up on the highlands, um, partly because some of the highlands might have been eroded at that particular time because of this uplift. But also, 
much of that sediment went to the north to form uh, the Brent Group. Um, you may or may not have heard of the Brent Group. It doesn't appear on land anywhere, so it's not all that well known. But it's basically Britain's biggest uh, oil reservoirs. Or, or mo nearly all of Britain's oil comes out of the Brent Group. So it's been really well studied. And actually, there's so much sediment in the Brent Group that it more or less accounts for, or can account for a good percentage of that. Uh, so since it's in the bread group, it can't be on the highlands. So I, I, could, I can't find a really good source, which is odd. So where am I getting my sediment from? So the obvious way to do this is to have an internal sediment source. Now, this cross-section, this is actually a cross-section through, um, it's actually cross-section through the west coast, doesn't really matter. Could be lined or could have been faults offsetting, offsetting the sort of um, the crust. And the idea is that on the uplifted side of the normal faults, we erode that those uplifted sides, those those are sticking up above land, they make land, or sticking up above the sea, I should say, they make land. They're eroding and they're supplying sediment into the downthrown side of the faults. So what we can do is within the highlands themselves, we can actually supply the sediment we need using these huge normal faults by simply eroding the uplifted parts into the, the downthrown parts. So we can't, we can't cover the whole of the highlands in a big, thick, uh, uniform layer of sediment. It's got to vary in thickness. We've got to have erosive parts. We've got to have depositional parts. Where are those faults? Now, the faults themselves are old Caledonian faults. There are no, uh, well, I don't think there are any specifically Mesozoic or uh, faults. I think all the faults that were moving in the Mesozoic were of Caledonian age. So they, they all formed in, um, in the lower Paleozoic. And many of them were, were huge faults then. So the Great Glen Fault, for example, that runs through the Great Glen. And that was a massive strike split fault. But during the Jurassic, Great Glen Fault was a normal fault, and that can be mapped offshore using a seismic image. All of the faults, all of these big, um, all these big faults, where they have sediment against them, where they have Mesozoic sediment against them, they all show signs of activity in the Mesozoic. So, a uh, famous, uh, famous place is the Helmsdale Fault, where you can go and look at Mesozoic sediments against the Helmsdale Fault, where you've got Mesozoic sediments against the Great Glen Fault, where they formed. And on the other side of the country, you've got the Camasunary Skerivore Fault, CF here, if you can see that in the just near Rum, that's uh, Camasunary Fault, Camasunary Fault. Um, so the, this fault here, that again has good evidence that it was moving in the Mesozoic. So it doesn't take a huge leap of imagination to say, well, we've got Mesozoic faulting on the uh, west side of the country, we've got Mesozoic faulting on the east side, maybe we had it in the middle as well. Now, I'm going to admit now we don't have um, direct, direct evidence of uh, movement on these faults in the middle of the highlands. And that's because the evidence you tend to see is deformed sediments because we don't have these sediments. We've all been eroded off. So, this is a kind of summary. This is my cross section again. Now, remember, this cross section is actually a cross section across the west coast of the, the current highlands. But you can imagine it applied, it might apply to the, the, the whole of the, the highlands in the past. So what we've got is we've got these big sedimentary basins defined by normal faults with uh, the, the, the uplifted side of the fault eroding and the sediment accumulating on the, the downthrown side of the fault. So that's the, the diagram at the top. That's what the highlands well, they wouldn't have been highlands as such, but what present day highlands might have looked like in the Mesozoic, that top diagram. And then along came the Paleocene, and we had massive uplifting, massive uplift of Scotland, uh, basically lifting up the geology. The blue dotted line on the lower diagram is the approximate erosion level, present day erosion level. So on the west coast, we have preserved sedimentary basins. On the east coast, we had preserved sedimentary basins. In the middle, we're down to metamorphic basements, no, no basins left. Why did that happen? Well, it's written in big red letters. You should surely have read by now. Um, 
the the process the obvious process to do this is something called underplating now this has to be a permanent effect it can't be um, temporary uplift due to uh, due to heating of uh, the underlying mantle you can't blame a mantle plume or anything like that because it's got to be a permanent effect and one of the ways to move to, to uplift across and leave it lifted is to intrude large amounts of magma into the lower into the lower crust or even un, basically immediately underneath the crust. So if you intrude large amounts of magma, and I mean large amounts, into the lower crust, you thicken the crust. And because the crust is essentially floating on the mantle, thicker crust floats higher. So the idea is that we've got massive intrusion of magma into the, the center of the highlands uh, associated with the Paleocene that rifted. One oddity is, of course, um, I'm sure most of you know that uh, you're familiar with the volcanic activity in places like Sky, um, Aaron. One oddity is that that volcanism is concentrated on the present day West Coast. But to get the present day topography of the highlands, you've got to have that uplift centered on, well, the middle of the highlands, basically, which means that the volcanism isn't really showing us where the main underground activity is. That's not that unbelievable. Um, the link between surface volcanism and, and subsurface activity is not that well understood. So it's, it's not, it's by, it's by no means impossible. Which leaves us with the question of um, was there chalk over the highland? So if they were only uplifted during the uh, post Cretaceous, so there were no highlands, during the Cretaceous, um, the late Cretaceous, did we have chalk over the highland? I imagine everybody knows what chalk is. So that's a picture from Flamborough Head. Uh, it's the northernmost um, big piece of chalk in the in the in the UK. Uh, and if you've never been there, you must surely have seen pictures of the uh, the White Cliffs of Dover. What's the chalk there? Well, as I said before, you can erode chalk away and leave essentially nothing. However, chalk contains flint, which looks like this. So the two bits of flint uh, at the there's three bits of rock there. The, the bit at the front is actually a piece of chalk. The two bits at the back are uh, fist-sized pieces of flint. Now, I found those two near the harbour at Helmsdale in northeast Scotland. They probably came out of a boat. They were probably moved as ballast um, in, a, in an empty sailing boat. So they, they, you can't use those as evidence. Um, the bit of chalk is interesting. Tom Challens actually found that. He found it two minutes after I told the class that although we could find some flint, there was no way we were going to find any chalk because it's way too soft. It's just going to be destroyed by erosion. Um, Tom found a piece within like it was two or three minutes. That's the only piece we've ever found, Tom, by the way, if you want to come back to Helmstone and find another bit. Um, and it's definitely, definitely chalk. It's actually got a stylite through it. So the reason the photographs, the reason it's got that orientation, if you look um, basically about mid at about the mid height in the chalk, it's actually got a style like running through it. That is definitely chalk. So we find flint and chalk in Scotland. Um, we've got to be very wary though about whether the stuff's been basically moved by man. Uh, and as everybody knows, prehistoric man mined chalk. So there's a fair number of occurrences of both flint and chalk in Scotland. Um, Den and Bottom. That that's actually has prehistoric flint mines. You, you may have heard of the more famous ones down in England, um, Grim, Grimes Graves, they're really famous. Uh, so these are similar, uh, they're not so well developed, I'm afraid, in terms of tourism. Um, that's actually chalk erratic, so, I mean, huge erratic. Um, the Book and Flint gravels, they're now to be thought to be Paleocene, Eocene age. Um, we have glacial gravels. There are some flint and glacial gravels in the middle and valley. So excavations in in Walk was actually we actually found flint. There's a big piece of chalk in, in Arran that fell into a volcano, and there's um, little bits of flint and chalk in Ely and Fife, which I've never been to see. I don't know if it's actually visible nowadays. It was definitely around in 1902, apparently. And there's some very dubious-looking stuff, which people claim is flint, but I'm not in the slightest bit convinced on the Isle of on the Isle of Egg. All of these are kind of peripheral to the highlands. None of them are really in the highlands themselves. They're all kind of around the edges. Um, so what's their chalk on the highlands? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, the, we've got no conclusive proof, which is a shame. 
So conclusion, this is my conclusion slide. What did the highlands look like during the Mesozoic? Well, I think they may have looked a bit like this photograph. Um, this is one of those Mesozoic sedimentary basins. Uh, it's fault controlled. Uh, this, is, this is actually Sky. This is Bering Bay, if anyone's been to here. Um, sky, uh, the rocks all dip, they all, they all tilt towards the west, and they have a steep um, easterly coast, which is controlled by the fault between Sky and Rosin. So as a model for, for what the highlands might have looked like with eroding fault scarps and uh, sedimentary basins, which is the sea in this case, um, you know, it's possible, not impossible that this is actually pretty much what the highlands look like uh, during the Mesozoic. That's it. Thank you very much.